who actually direct the government. The secret government that we talk about is, yes, there is a secret government and there's FEMA and there's people impersonating presidents. But, but more than that, it's behind the power structure, the invisible power structure here is pulling the strings of the creditors who are in fact then directing the United States federal government. If you wonder why NAFTA and GATT were passed with so little debate, it's because it was all smoke and whistles. It had already been decided by those who direct the government that these are the bills that are going to be passed, including the counterterrorism bill and everything that Congress does, except maybe making some ridiculous joint resolution about making something a national holiday for parakeets or something. That, you know, they may, they may you know, have some power, but not a lot. The real significant bills and the real significant budgets are directed lock, stock, and barrel by the creditors. We either fund them or we don't fund them. It's as simple as that. If you wonder why they're building prisons instead of schools and they had to cut the lunch program, it's because that's the agenda of the creditors of the federal United States. We can afford to build prisons, no problem. We can afford to put 100,000 new revenue agents out on the street, call them police, but what we're really doing is trying to raise some more revenue to keep the government open. We can afford to put a rapid strike force out there. We can afford to bring in 500,000 United Nations troops and build all these concentration camps. But we can't afford money for education. We can't afford money for school lunches or anything else that's really important. So be very clear that it's the creditors of the Federal United States, which is the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the sovereign powers behind that are the creditors who are directing it. All of the nation states of the United Nations are bankrupt. It's one of the conditions of membership, by the way, of the United Nations. You have to be a bankrupt country. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't be subject to being controlled. Now, can you? When you become bankrupt, you transfer your sovereignty, your sovereignty, because you stole it from the people, right? You stole your sovereignty from the people in the states, and now you basically hand it over to the creditors to direct the affairs of the nation and the spending policies, et cetera, et cetera. So how did all this happen? Well, we'll have to talk a little bit of economics in order to see how this historically happened. Now, as you probably know from reading your Constitution, that Congress has the authority to coin money, which is gold or silver, and that's what a constitutional money system comprises. The Founding Fathers were pretty smart about a number of things, and that was one thing. They knew that as soon as they issued paper money substitutes or created a national banking system, it wouldn't be very long before the international bankers were controlling not only the government but the economic system. And so that's why they put us on a gold standard and made it a constitutional standard. When the Constitution was first created, it was created as an ultra-sovereign canon law trust. All governments, nation states, and sovereign powers operate within trust structures. All of them. We can also operate in trust structures, and we'll talk about trusts in a little bit. But the original ultra-sovereign canon law trust was merged from both the common law of the Constitution and uh, in England, but also the canon laws from the Pope. When the ultra-sovereign canon law trust was created in 1776, and we the people were the trustees of that trust up until 1913. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act created a joint stock trust that replaced the ultra-sovereign canon law trust and made we the international bankers as the trustees of that trust and assigned the US citizens as beneficiaries of the trust. The trust structure that existed in 1776 was replaced with another one. That's called the coup d'etat under law. It was done by law. It was done legally, okay? All of this usurpation has happened legally, not lawfully, legally. And so the status of we the people was reversed from the top at the helm to the bottom, which is getting the handouts, basically. Free lunches, food stamps, welfare, whatever, civil rights, whatever we want to hand you guys. Now, it all seems like a great idea to be the beneficiary of a trust, doesn't it? It's not like, wow, I'm going to really cash in, aren't I? Being the beneficiary of a trust. Well, unfortunately, the only thing you're going to cash in on is an obligation to pay the debt. Prior to 1913, the American people had direct veto power against spending policies of the federal government because in order for the federal government to borrow any money, it had to go to the people. There was no central bank it could go to. It had to sell bonds. 
If you didn't want to go to war, you didn't buy the bonds. If you didn't want this pork project that the government had in mind, you didn't buy the bonds. It was a very simple system, a Republican system whereby you had veto power, economic veto power. And it worked very well until 1913. That's how come government managed to stay small because it didn't have an unlimited credit line to go on a shopping spree for 80 years and make you pay for it. So in 1913 there was this convenient new arrangement made. The Federal Reserve Act created an unlimited credit line for the federal United States government to borrow directly from the Federal Reserve Bank and obligated the American people to pay it back completely bypassing what was our veto power and they no longer had to come to us directly to ask permission to fund something. They went directly to the bank. Now, if you go to the bank and want to borrow some money, what do you got to do? You got to put collateral up, right? They're not going to give you a $5,000 loan if you have no collateral, if it's unsecured. You're going to have to put up your house, your car, your land or something, right? Well, it's no different for the government, except the government doesn't have any assets. That's the difference. And so instead of putting up the assets they didn't have, they put up your assets. They said, here, we'll make you a deal. You lend us all the money and we're going to collateralize first the gold and then the land and then the corporations, then the national parks and forests, then the birth certificates, until we've collateralized all the tangible property in the United States of America. The first thing they collateralized against the debt in 1913 was the gold. It's called hypothecate. It's a legal term means that theoretically, if you can't pay it off, hardy har har, we're going to take the collateral, which they did in 1933. It only took 17 years under this new arrangement for the federal United States to go bankrupt the first time. Only 17 years before they couldn't service the debt, the interest on the debt of the money that they had borrowed. And so they had to declare bankruptcy in the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1930, 13, pardon me, 1930, 16 nations went bankrupt after World War I. And this was one of them, the United States, federal United States. And so when the country went bankrupt, it precipitated the Great Depression, which was also manipulated and created by the international bankers to demoralize the people, number one, but also to shift power away from the sovereign people, to shift the land away, and to shift the gold away from the people and into the hands of the international bankers and the sovereign power structures behind them. So in 1933, with House Joint Resolution 192, on the floor of Congress, the Federal United States declared bankruptcy and no longer could service debt with gold because it had no more. And so it then made what we call now legal tender or fiat money, a money paper substitute, and then decreed that, well, since we don't have any gold, you know, we'll just have to use paper instead. And then they passed the Gold Standard Act in 1935 and confiscated all the gold from the American people to satisfy the creditors of the United States. And the people willingly handed all their gold over to the nearest Federal Reserve Bank and initially got a paper currency that was redeemable in gold or silver at a revalued, at a revaluation from one twentieth of an ounce to one thirty-fifth of an ounce. But shortly thereafter, within a matter of a couple of years, you no longer could redeem it. So you basically traded gold for paper. What a great deal. That was the first bankruptcy. And ever since that point, we have been proceeding down the road of an exponential debt curve whereby there is only one possible conclusion of an economic system set up on an unsound and unsustainable basis, which is bankruptcy. Not just for the government, but for all the people as well. And so the federal government went bankrupt, and every time it's gone bankrupt, it's transferred more of the assets of the American people over to the international bankers. And because the American people are not aware of the nature of ownership, the nature of titles, the nature of sovereignty itself, we allow that to happen. A deed is not title. You do not have title if you have a deed. You can pay your mortgage for 30 years and you will not own your property. You only have a deed. A deed is not a title. A title is the land patent. It's called an allodial title. 
You lost the allodial title the minute you collateralized your land and borrowed money and put up your land as security against it. It's a condition of every bank contract that the allodial titles reverts to the federal government as a condition of every bank contract and mortgage in this country. But you didn't know that. Go ask the title insurance companies. They know, but they won't tell you. They scream at me and hang up the phone every time I call them and ask them, please tell me about allodial titles. Don't you ever call me again. Because they're engaged in monumental fraud, that's why. Because they've deceived you out of your title. You can get it back by updating your land patent. One of the supplemental books that I offer is on allodial titles and land patents. And there is a process there where you can declare your land patent and rewrite the legal description of the original land patent, file it with the county recorder's office, and it'll put one more line of resistance between you and any foreclosure.